Welcome, 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 geeks and nerds, girls and boys, to another all-new edition of Geek to Me Radio. Today, our early Halloween edition, we'll be talking with Jim Oosley and Ben Sawyer from the Dead Palace about their upcoming event at the Wizard Wagon. Adam Walenta will tell us about his Punk Taco Volume 2 Kickstarter, and we're joined by the Newton Brothers talking about scoring the Haunting of Hill House. Stand by. This segment and this whole show actually brought to you by the city of St. Charles. Check out their awesome website, discoverstcharles.com. Discover St. Charles is what you should be doing for a good time. We're in the fall season. Legends and Lanterns is coming up the last two weekends of October. It'll be amazing if you're a Halloween fan, a history buff. This combines all that fun for the whole family. It'll have living history characters like Lizzie Borden, Baron Samdi, uh, the Phantom of the Opera, and many others that you can interact with, learn their story. And it's just a great time in a great environment. We're so lucky to have Main Street St. Charles right here, basically in our own backyard, quick drive from anywhere. You can check out more about that event, Legends and Lanterns, and plan your upcoming trips. There's always something going on in historic St. Charles. That website, once again, discover stcharles.com. Very proud to have them as the premier sponsor of geek to me radio we're going to get right into it another event coming up for the halloween season will be at the wizard wagon in the del mar loop area jim oosley and ben sawyer who we've had on before talking about their new dead palace release and here's what the boys had to say we're talking with ben sawyer and jim oosley uh, they've been in the studio with us before several times talking about the dead palace and this time they've got a brand new event coming up at wizard wagon uh, gentlemen thanks very much for coming in thanks for having us my pleasure as always so uh, what is the event? Tell us a little bit about uh, what is going on at this event and where it's located. Uh, it's the Dead Palace Meet and Creep. Not Beat and Greet, but Meet and Creep. Okay. And it's the, uh, the release party for our new book, our 150-page uh, graphic novel, The Dead Palace. And uh, it's going to be really fun. We tried to put it together like a Halloween party that we would like to go to. You know, So we're going to have uh, – we're going to be there. Signing the book and people that pre-order the book and pick it up there, or you can just buy it there that that night. Um, Wicked Pixel Cinema is going to be there. Uh, Eric Stanzi, yeah. Jason Chris, and Jake Kelly is going to be there. Um, you know, selling their movies and that kind of stuff. Uh, Patrick Voss and his VFX company are going to be there. Um, they're going to have a room in the back called the Quarter of Blood, and it's going to be like a special effects thing you can walk through and check out some of his like horror movie effects and stuff. And we'll have a DJ there, and it's going to be a it's a really cool party. Very yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And the Wizard Wagon, they took kind of, kind of uh, where Star Clipper used to be. They're in that area there right on Del Mar. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Right past uh, Blueberry Hill there. And yeah, it's easy to find. Just look for all the crazy costumed horror people. So you guys have been making the rounds. We had the, we had you on, I think, for your Christmas event, um, if I'm not mistaken, was the last time you, you were in the studio with me. Do we have a Christmas event? We might have had, uh, I mean, we launched about a year ago. Or Kickstarter, uh, yeah. Kickstarter. And I, I, uh, we had a few events public to either crowdfund or congratulate the success of the crowdfund or uh, just to talk about the book in general. So, we, yeah, we've had a few events. In this past Wizard World, you guys sold out, I remember. Uh, yeah. We did. Congratulations yeah. on that. So, it's, it's doing Thanks. well. So, yeah. what's what's new uh, for this newest one that uh, you've got coming out at the Wizard Wagon event? Well, that um, what we sold before was a s- sampler. Mm-hmm. Uh, we... What we made the first go felt finished to us. We're like, this is what we're going to make. This is done. What do you guys think? And then we sold out and we went, oh, maybe we should make more of this. So this is 150 pages. So I guess it would be, what, about 120 pages more mm. than the original. It's a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, 
and Jim just crank, kept cranking out new stories and uh, and new ideas. And yep, yeah, here we are, 150 pages later. So it's it is what you saw, bef- or if you've got the old copy, it is that plus new stories, ten stories altogether, I think. Plus, you know, even the uh, a couple of the stories in in the sampler book that came out at Wizard World. You know, Ben's gone back in and mm-hmm. he's updated a lot of things we've added to the script. So he's mm-hmm. added panels to those stories. So even if you've got that one, this one's going to be a really cool new experience. Yeah, like the director's cut edition because you've added new stuff to it now. Well, you know, it <laughs> was going to be yeah, it was going to be 125 pages. Yeah. That's what we planned on, mm-hmm. but it swelled to 150. So uh, and it's got a. Um, Ben's got an art gallery in the back. A bunch of our favorite artists contributed pinups to the book. Mm-hmm. Um, I have like a five or six page essay in the back called Head Trauma about the inspiration behind each story. So it's really a, a fun, really a fun experience more than a, more than a book, I think. It'll be something that can really have a long, you know, long shelf life, I think. Something you can go back to and enjoy. Yeah, it's not just a graphic novel you read cover to cover. It's, you know, supplemental material and, you know. Weird looks inside of our heads and things like that. But back to the Christmas thing, uh, the Christmas event thing, because were you wanting us to have a Christmas event with you? I don't really look much like a Santa. Is that what you were, you were doing? <laughs> no, I think it was it was for the uh, – you had another – maybe it wasn't Dead Palace, actually. There was a Christmas event. You played – Oh, yeah, Christmas. it was the concert, yeah. The con- that was it. Yes, It was yes, for yes. Metro Theater. We did yes. a comic book for, for that that Ben and I That's contributed. Right. That's the one. Okay, I yeah. knew it was something Christmas. I'm like, well, maybe it wasn't Dead Palace, though, because I'm – Playing it back in my mind, yeah. So that's that's where the confusion. I I'm so sorry. I nope, got to tell you, working on this book the last year feels like two, maybe three years have gone by. Yeah, that yeah. Christmas thing we put together feels like an eternity ago. Yeah, it does feel like yeah, <laughs> at least two years ago for me. For yeah, sure. yeah. It, it, time time goes very quickly, and of course, with all, if, if you're that busy, which is good, then things kind of get mixed up. I do that all the time. Um, you know, it keeps us off the streets, and right. I think that's good for us, and it's good for <laughs> society. Speak right. for yourself. So with the Wizard Wagon event, what are the, what are the times people can show up? Is it is it an all day event? Is it in the evening? It's, it's all, all, night. Evening. All, all night. All night. Yeah, <laughs> it's five to eight's the original slot. Mm-hmm. Uh, it may run late. They don't. Uh, I've Wizard Wagon has opened their doors for me just because I was walking by and I was like, "Hey, are you open?" This is sure. So they don't really kick you out per se. Um, so we might. We might run a little late. Who knows? If the it's a party, we'll just keep it just going. It's a suggestion. It's right. not a hard rule. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We might run late. We'll see. Depends how much fun we're having. But we're going to have giveaways and stuff. There's going to be uh, beer, Shafley's beer there for free, uh, candy for the kids. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a whole fun event. Like I said, we kind of planned it to be a party that we would want to go to, a Halloween party. And as far as I know, it's the only Halloween party in the loop. So. That's It'll be really great. Me very odd. The loop would be, I think, a great place for it. <laughs> yeah, Halloween yeah, for party. sure. So this is perfect for you guys to do. Yeah, that's great. what we thought. We thought, hey, let's do that. Yeah, do it then. So the hopefully the the music will be loud and the you know with the with a lot of glass there, so people will just walk in off the street maybe if they see something going on. Yeah. Try to make it look not too private. Right. right. A lot of times you'll see something. Like, oh, well, that's obviously not for me. Right. So hopefully if I won't wear my tuxedo then if I come. I won't. So people I, don't think it's a fancy I, no, event in there. I well, if you do the masquerade thing. And have a mask. Well, not only that, but can I say, I'd like you to wear your tuxedo. Would you? I mean, why not? Because I'm sorry, I find you very sexy in that. Well, that's kind of you to say. Kind of. <laughs> sure. <laughs> the more clothes I have, the better. That's what my well, wife that's says, what too. That's, that's what I'm trying to say, yeah. <laughs> Old roundabout way. I've seen you in a dressing room. Right, yeah, exactly. That's true. We've done shows. <laughs> and with uh, you, you mentioned the, with adding the new content to even stories you had in the original sampler, mm-hmm. um, is there always kind of that desire to want to tweak and adjust is are because uh-huh. it seems like we've talked to you both before and you always want to add more and tweak things and like that so when do you guys step back from a story and be like no that's perfect the way it is or is there always that desire as artists oh, want oh my to god it? we're turning into george lucas <laughs> i know yeah <laughs> we had to give ourselves a deadline yeah you know we had to say you know what it's done by this we're booking the release party mm-hmm. let's have it done by this time you know yeah self-imposed deadlines are Always a good idea, but the hardest to stick to. Uh, I even pushed them a few times because we were trying to finish back before September. I think September 1st was our first, was supposed to be a hard deadline, turned into a soft one. But I, I kept saying, I'm, I'm not done. I'm nowhere close. We have a whole other story to do. Uh, I don't want to speed up and ruin it, yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, Jim was gracious enough to to let us. Well, I mean, it, it all, all's well that ends well. We've got a Halloween release party. It couldn't ask for anything better, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> That's and, perfect. You know, it's uh, with Ben, too. Um, you know, we worked on the Rough and Tumble together. And the artwork that uh, Ben did for the Dead Palace is really going to blow people away. It, it's so good. So it's good that we took the time. And and that actually, you know, when he was taking in the time he needed for the art, I could go back and sort of like 
add little things here and there. And, you know, so it was, it really all worked out for the best for sure. Mm -hmm. So this has been something you've been working on for a while uh, because we've had you on before. We talked about it, grown it and increased it. And it's uh, swelled up, like you said, 150 pages. Is there going to be more added to it? Like next year, will we get a second edition Dead Palace? Is it going to be something that there's still more added to? Or is it going to be a new project, do you think? Deader Palace. Deader <laughs> Palace. And then and the Deadest Palace. <laughs> <laughs> most, yeah, most dead. Dead Harder. We'll just do the Die Hard thing. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. No, we, we haven't talked about that only because, I mean, we'll do something again for sure. Yeah. But we, we've been so focused on this that it's hard to even look beyond October 27th right now. You yeah, know? that's true. So. We feel like any one of these stories could be extrapolated again or more so. Uh, but we do uh, have our uh, – I'm trying to be fancy with the words. I can't think of it. Anyway, one of these stories is really appealing to us uh, that that we are going to try to develop. And uh, that's – that's uh, if you've read our original, it was called The Butcher Queen. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. we're, we're extending that to Bone Covenant Part 1 and 2. Um, and then we'd like to see it go even further than that. We we both really love the main character and the setting and all that stuff. So uh, if anything's to come, if it was up to us and anything was to develop out of this, we think that one is the next step. And so that'll be um, Saturday the 20th? Am I correct? 7th. Uh, October 27th. 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 Yep. One week. Okay, yeah. So it's a week from this coming Saturday yep. at the Wizard Wagon. Yep. It's five till eight-ish. eight-ish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> soft, yep. soft time for yep. close. Don't show up at eight, though. Who knows what's going to happen? Right, yeah. exactly. If you, so rowdy, we get get, if you want to get a copy, yeah, because <laughs> yeah. it's sold out at Wizard World. So or get it might get so early. rowdy, we get shut down early. Who knows? Or if people want to get it, like you said, they can uh, they can still get it in advance for it to be there when they arrive. They can. And the best way to do that would be the website? Um, yes, there's a website. It's the Death Palace dot Big Cartel. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Or Big Cartel. Whatever, how, however Big Cartel works. It's a big website. Find either the put Dead the name Palace. before or after or whatever. Yeah, it's, find the Dead Palace on Facebook, and yeah. you can go from there. Yeah. Perfect. Facebook, and then find the Dead Palace. And your guys are also on Twitter, at the Dead Palace. Mm-hmm. And Instagram. And so that's plenty everywhere. of places to find you. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jim Usley, Ben Zoyer, thanks very much for coming on air. Look forward to seeing you on the 27th at the Wizard Wagon. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jim Usley and Ben Sawyer. That was a fantastic time talking to them, as always. We're going to take our next break. We'll be right back talking with Adam Walenta about his Kickstarter for Punk Taco Volume 2. Stand by. Hey, it's Ralph Garman. You are listening to Geek to Me Radio. You've made an excellent choice. I can't believe how smart you are. It's incredible. Your brain is as huge as your biceps. We are back. This segment brought to you by Marcus Theaters. MarcusTheaters.com. If you're a movie fan, and let's face it, how can you not be with all the cool movies coming out these days? Marcus Theaters has you covered locations in 11 states besides just beautiful st louis here where we live they're all over the greater midwest region you can go to their website marcustheaters.com check out exactly which location is closest to you buy your tickets right there online you can check out the cool specials the cool group packages you can get gift cards check out the rewards points hopefully you're a member of the marcus magical movie rewards club and you get reimbursed for seeing movies uh discounts on concessions all sorts of cool things and since it's october fright nights in their retro series you can see movies like the shining Candyman, and the exorcist on the big screen you can get your tickets for those events right there as well check that out and more marcus theaters.com we are joined now by Adam Walenta talking about his Kickstarter for Punk Taco Volume 2. I love having comic book creators on air with us. Uh, that's part of the reason I'm doing this show. And here is our chat with Adam Walenta. We're joined now by Adam Walenta talking about a new Kickstarter he's got going for his comic series, Punk Taco. This is the Volume 2 of Punk Taco, if I'm not mistaken, correct? That's correct. And tell us a little bit about, for those who aren't familiar, tell us what, uh, tell us what Punk Taco is. Okay, so uh, Punk Taco is an all-ages graphic novel series that I created with my son, uh, who at the time was five years old, and we were just hanging out, playing Legos, and I was telling him about this name that I had rattling around in my head, Punk Taco, and he thought it was hysterical and started coming up with ideas for the character and his friends, and 
uh, the antagonist and what the story would be like. And we were just going back and forth. And uh, I was actually in the middle of another graphic novel series that I was working on. And I put that on hold because there was such a great energy um, between my son and I working together. And I wanted to, uh, you know, take this opportunity to create something with him. Uh, so we worked on the story together. We wrote it all out. Um, he did character designs and sketches, and then I took those designs and I brought them to life, um, you know, uh, finished them off. And then um, uh, we brought Punk Taco to life. Volume 1 came out in May, and uh, we've been all over the country promoting it. It's it's a great all-ages story. It's about an alien taco, uh, which can only come from the mind of a you know, a five-year-old, <laughs> my son's seven now, by the way. Um, so Punk Taco is an alien taco, and he's got this band of misfits that he rocks out across the universe with. And uh, along the way, they're known for getting in a little bit of trouble. They, they make a lot of new friends. Um, and in Volume 1, they um, come across a intergalactic tyrant, uh, and they have to basically save the universe and um, do so, uh, you know, all while trying to be uh, the, the best that they can. Uh, Punk Taco is, is he's all about friendship, and he has a lot of empathy and compassion for other beings throughout the universe, but what he really can't tolerate are bullies and tyrants. So whenever you know, one happens across his path, he has a hard time resisting, like, you know, jumping into the battle and, and mixing it up with you know, any evildoers out there. Well, it's got to be a seven-year-old's dream at the time, five-year-old, now seven, to uh, be working on a comic book series. That's got to be a thrill, I would think. (laughs) He he loves it. Um, There are times when he's definitely, you know, like any child, uh, they get distracted and they want to do other things. You know, once once, at the beginning, like he was very gung ho, and then when he realized, you know, all the work that has to be put into it, (laughs) there were times when he uh, was like, "Uh, (laughs) "Do we have to work on this now?" But overall, like he loves it, especially now that the product is finished. Um, he's very excited for Volume 2, and he loves going to the conventions. And um, even though he's a little shy at times with, with meeting new people, um, he really does enjoy it. And he gets a kick out of uh, doing his own little illustrations, and he's been selling them at conventions. And, you know, to, to people that just happen along that are, you know, find his artwork great. And, you know, this weekend, even at New York Comic Con, we had a couple – uh, very famous artist with no, you know, push for me, just be intrigued with his artwork and purchase it. And, you know, it was a great ego boost for him, um, you know, to give him some confidence. So he's been having a lot of fun. That's awesome. I know uh, artists are always the best people to help. They always want to support other artists. So that's that's nice to hear that even the big names are, are, are still like that and still supporting uh, your guys' work on Punk Taco. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know, whenever things are slow, he gets a little down, you know, because he doesn't understand that, you know, not everybody could buy everything. Um, so when somebody comes up and, you know, without any, uh, you know, prompting from me at all and just takes interest in his work, it's really encouraging. And, you know, it's, it's awesome for me because I, I get to see his, his face light up and, and get excited. And now you've got the Kickstarter out for volume two of Punk Taco, which I assume the easiest way is people go to Kickstarter website. Type in Punk Taco, it'll pull it right up, yeah? Absolutely. Very easy. And, uh, you know, it doesn't cost a thing to pledge right away until it's absolutely funded. So, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I don't have money now, and and I completely understand that. But, you know, Kickstarter doesn't take a a dime from you until we're funded. So um, it's it's great if we can get everybody's support. Um, It's a great project. It continues. Um, Volume 1 is a self-contained story, but we do have an epilogue. Um, that takes us into uh, Volume 2, um, and it's a pretty exciting story. It's going to be even bigger and better than the first one. A lot of crazy aliens, uh, a really wild adventure. Um, so I think it's a lot of fun that people will enjoy. And that was going to be my next question. I was wondering if people have to read Volume 1 to understand Volume 2, but it doesn't sound like that's the case at all. No, not really. I, we're going to do uh, you know a little um, synopsis of what came before at the beginning of Volume 2, but we try to keep them all self-contained stories. Uh, volume 1 is still available, um, and you can get it on Kickstarter with, with this package as well. We have like a Book Lover Supreme uh, reward that gets you both volumes. Uh, so if you don't have Volume 1, don't worry. You can still get a copy, and uh, we'd love if you did. And so if you want to support this, if you're listening right now, and we always encourage you to support indie everything, indie movies, indie film, indie comics, uh, Kickstarter is the website, and just look up Punk Taco. They'll have that thing there where you can help 
Adam get this funded. If people want to find other work by you and if they want to keep up with you, where, what are the best ways, website, social media tags? Absolutely. My name is Adam Walenta, W-A-L-L-E-N-T-A, and that's adamwalenta.com. That's my, my website with my portfolio, um, all the different work that I've done for other companies and, and other industries. Uh, same thing on Twitter, at Adam Walenta, Facebook, Adam Walenta. <laughs> we kept it real simple. Um, <laughs> so as long as you could uh, spell my name, you can Google me, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, anywhere. And uh you know, if you hit me up on those sites, I love to actually communicate and socialize with people. So please do. I know a lot of in a lot of cases on social media, it's just a lot of following and lurking. Uh, but I do like <laughs> to connect with the people that buy the book and support the book and get to know what they're thinking and um, talk to them about comics and music and everything else. Perfect. So, Adam yeah. Walenta, Punk Taco Volume 2. Best of luck with the Kickstarter. We'll, uh, we'll watch it, and hopefully you'll get all the way there. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for everybody that's listening. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Adam Walenta, very cool concept, Punk Taco Volume 2. We're going to take our next break, come right back talking with the Newton Brothers all about their scoring of that new Netflix series, The Haunting of Hill House. Stand by. This is Alan Oppenheimer, the voice of Skeletor, and you're listening to Geek to Me. We are back. If you've heard this show before, and I hope you certainly have, if you haven't, you go back and check out our archived shows on Podomatic, Google Play, iTunes, and SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts from. Find Geek to Me Radio. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at geek to me radio and facebook.com slash geek to me radio but if you have heard the show before you know i love talking with composers composers of music for video games from tv shows from movies and the next guests i have are the newton brothers talking all about composing the music for the new netflix series the haunting of hill house we're joined now by andy grush and taylor newton stewart the newton brothers composers extraordinaire gentlemen thanks very much for joining me on air thanks Thanks for having us absolutely so the um, obviously Taylor Newton Stewart, but then it's Andy Grush. Where does the Newton brothers come from? Are you two actually related? <laughs> we're uh, we're <laughs> brothers from another mother. So so no, we're not actually we're not actually related. No, I, the name the name derived from originally we were both uh, working for different uh, people at the time, and and they wanted us solely to work under those projects, and we had other things come up, so uh, we used a name uh, at the time of our favorite mathematician. Uh, Isaac Newton, and um, and then we uh, wrote under that name, and then it just stuck. And then as projects got bigger, and we kind of started doing our own thing, it, it, we, next thing you know, we were just kind of just kind of took a life of its own. All right, so it's just the Newton brothers. Nothing complicated like Kelmar and Ruby or anything like that. Just <laughs> the Newton brothers. That's that's nice. <laughs> exactly. It is. It's nice. It's warm. It's warm, and you know, exactly. And the, we are obviously going to talk about The Haunting of Hill House coming out October 12th on Netflix. Uh, this movie, the original, black and white, is still to this day, I think, one of the most terrifying horror movies ever made. Uh, the updating that they did with Liam Neeson, uh, not as much. But when you were scoring this one, uh, and again, Netflix, October 12th, uh, very excited to see Timothy Hutton in this. What were the influences? What did you pull from? Did you look at both movies? How did the process of composing the score for this come about? Uh, well, we did look at both movies just to, you know, just to have looked at them. But I think um, the Robert Wise version was definitely something that we we spent some time with. And, and, and Mike, Mike loves that, that film, that version as well. Um, so in addition to... In addition to the book, uh, we kind of, I mean, we didn't draw any direct influence musically, I, I would say, but we did take like just from the tone and the vibe and the way things were sort of uh, structured musically and tried to like a- at least be in the same world. And I think early on, we, we actually tried to kind of write for instrumentation that was even more classical than where we ended up just to kind of give it that feel hmm. uh but ultimately that nowadays that doesn't seem to play really well like everyone wants to hear like high def sounds and the latest and greatest in sounds and sonic capabilities so we, we ended up kind of with a more 
updated sound. But um, I think it, it's interesting. There's there's we leaned into some woodwind work to try and like capture a little bit of that old flavor. And I think it came, became across uh, as sort of helpful in, in doing that. Um, so it was, uh, it was a good time. That music, uh, it can drive the tension. Sometimes there's gaps where there's no music and having no sound at all even builds the suspense more. When you guys got to work on this, the haunting of Hill house, did you get to screen it? So you kind of knew where to put the gaps in music, where it would be silent, where the music would swell. We had, I think that it was a little bit of a process because we would sit in the spotting sessions and talk about where things should go, where we should try putting things. And then it was actually pretty cool because we had the ability to, Taylor and I sometimes are not able to always make it to the dub stage to get the final mix. But strangely, we kind of made it a point to be on the dub stage because we were able to be pretty creative on the dub stage with uh, the director, Mike Flanagan, and, and the help of our music editor to to kind of write for all the things where we think we wanted music, but then on the stage be able to sort of creatively look at it and, and say, like, let's, let's pu- actually, let's pull this piece of score out and see what happens if it plays silent. And that's sort of a, a luxury that we usually don't get. It's usually, uh, you know, you're usually writing and the process is happening so quickly that everything just sort of happens. But it was really nice to be able to spend those days sort of, you know, away from having written weeks prior and then listening again and seeing it in the context of, of each episode and deciding like, oh, let's play no music at all here because it's really creepy. Um, it was really effective. I think, I think, and that was, that was all following, you know, Flanagan's direction of where things should go and shouldn't go. So he was brilliant in doing that. And with the film, uh, also being produced by Steven Spielberg, not that you guys are, uh, new to being around big names or anything like that, but Steven Spielberg, one of the biggest Amblin entertainment, uh, behind this one as well. How was he to work with? Did he give much input? Did he kind of let you guys do your own thing? Um, as far as I know, uh, I think he had involvement uh, early on. Uh, he spoke with uh, Mike Flanagan, the, the creator, and uh, you know they, they, I'm sure, talked and had ideas and went back and forth. Um, I think once it got going, I think they just let you know everybody was really happy with what they saw, and uh, you know Mike is not a person who doesn't know what he wants. He's, he's very clear, very specific. Uh, he's a very a vision of, of how he wants it to, to be, and, and I think people saw it and they loved it and that's kind of how it how it went so i think uh their involvement uh was i think early on but not so much later we're going to come back talking more with the newton brothers talking about working with stephen king on one of their projects and which is better to work for hulu or netflix we'll get all the dirt on that more stand by Hello, this is Kari Payton, King Ezekiel from The Walking Dead, and I encourage everyone to listen to Geek to Me. It's a lovely program. Would I ever steer you wrong? We are back. Still talking with the Newton Brothers about their composition for the scores of fantastic horror movies and TV shows and series that you've no doubt seen, and we just get into a little bit more of that. And like I said, you guys are no stranger to horror films either with uh, Ouija, Origin of Evil, Oculus. Uh, you just did an extinction with the brilliant Lizzie Kaplan. Um, how do you approach these are all kind of slightly different horror elements in all these movies. How do you approach scoring? Because it's not just we're scoring horror. There's different elements of it. There's different aspects of it in each one of these uh, shows or films. So how do you start the process i guess we usually spend a lot of time talking about the story uh taylor and i tend to before we even write music for whatever project we're working on we we spend a lot of time long phone conversations or lots of coffee hanging out together just discussing the story and the characters and almost almost overthinking and over talking the characters and their situations in life to try to get a sense for what the element of horror or drama should be. Uh, Because I think the, I think the 
best horror is is played when you feel as an audience you feel something for a character or a group of characters and i think if you don't if you don't feel for someone or connect with a character uh you lose sight of like when something tragic happens it doesn't impact you as much so we usually try to focus on how can we build up this character so that we fall in love with this character um, so that if something tragic or sometimes something good happens, you, you feel like you are along for that journey and feeling their pain or, you know, or their joy for, for us, it tends to be more pain, but, uh, either way it, it applies to both, both scenarios, I guess. <laughs> and working with Stephen King also on Gerald's game, uh, another Netflix, um, again, the, the different styles are you, is there ever, is there ever any, uh, level of, uh, You've been at it for a decade now, but is there any level of intimidations like, oh, Stephen King's behind this one, just like Steven Spielberg producing the last one? Is there is that ever there for you, or are you both just confident enough you do your own thing after this long where it's not even a big deal? Uh, I think, you know, I think we're both very excited early on. And then there is, you know, there's, it depends on the schedule and what's, you know, what's occurring and, and, and who in, who's involved. That does obviously affect everything. You know, we did a, uh, extinction, which originally was going to be universal. We, we scored that in about three weeks. Um, and it should have been really about a three month, uh, time mm. period to score it. So it was very short and it was much more stressful. Um, there was less time to, to have playbacks and to talk and kind of create things. It was more of just let's go, 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 go. So I think it differs from project to project with Mike Flanagan. You know, we have shorthand with him. We, we know what he wants. Uh, and when we do, you know, we usually have a round where we just try things that are really maybe out there or that maybe would seem outlandish at first. Um, and that, and then he kind of draws us back in, but we try to push the bra- the boundaries a bit. Um, and obviously those first times it's a little scary because you know, you're, you're, you're not wanting to, the music is, uh, is very subjective and obviously you want, uh, you know, you want to please the people you're working with. It's a team effort. You want to make everybody happy. So there is definitely a little fear in that, and that and it doesn't really ever go away. It's it's, it's always there. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what's strange is that that it it doesn't it doesn't go away. I, I feel like if you you learn something new in life or do something new, if you do it a few times, it becomes comfortable and then it becomes easy to do. I would say that my stress level every time we have a playback on every project is is really high. Like I have a tough time sleeping the night before a first playback because it's just, you know, you, you're, you're, you've got to put it all out there and try things, but in trying things and, and, and being creative, some, sometimes that creativity is, is not well received or sometimes it's just on the wrong page. Sometimes it's a home run and everything works, but it's, it's so funny that it doesn't seem to get easier. I almost want to say it gets <laughs> more, it, I almost want to say it gets worse because we're constantly trying to like, improve, which I, I think is where good things come from, right? I, I think if you, yeah. if something is really easy and comfortable, I, I don't think you're going to push yourself. But I think if you're f- freaked out, a certain amount of that is, is very useful. It's healthy. It gets those endorphins going and everything else. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. also with uh, Into the Dark on Hulu, with Hulu versus Netflix, did you guys find, and again, I, I'm not uh, by any means looking for you to disparage one or the other, but I'm just curious, was there a difference as far as the, the level of production, the, the type of uh, assistance you were giving in doing the projects or anything like that? Was there anything notable uh, between working with one versus the other? Um, not so much, no. I mean, we, you know, we uh, had a lot of freedom on Into the Dark, especially the body uh, and we did the main titles and, um, you know, everybody was really supportive. Uh, I think most of that stuff on the first, our first round, actually, they, they all loved what we did. Hulu loved what we did. Um, and there was a lot of, uh, songs strangely too, uh, in that uh, episode. And we ended up doing some of the songs or most of the songs and then the score as well. So, um, but they were, they responded very well. It was very smooth and Netflix, um, you know, on Haunting Hill House, we we mainly saw them at playbacks. Uh, but Mike is the one who dealt with, you know, dealt with them and, and, and handled them. So we didn't really have anything negative that we, we got back. And it all went really smoothly on, on both both, uh, both sides. 
And with the projects you both have worked on, uh, like I said, for a decade or more now, do either one of you have a favorite project like this it has a really special meaning because of this or, you know, I really enjoyed working on this show or anything like that? For me, I think uh, Haunting of Hill House really sits with me well now just because it's such a unique animal and that you've got 10 hours to tell a story. So you, you get uh, one of the uh, the leads in it. Kate Siegel said it real well. Like you, you get like all the meaty like detail of getting 10 hours of character uh, with, you know, film scares throughout it as well. So you kind of get like the, the best of, of both worlds, which is so true. And I think that from a musical standpoint, point, that really allowed us to play with the idea of hinting at themes early on so that they could pay off in the end and um, being able to kind of spread the music out as opposed to like really hammer home like, all right, we have 90 minutes and, and, you know, this theme needs to be, you know, hummable by the end, but not in the way of dialogue throughout the film. This was, this was a nice process because we could kind of like be very delicate with things and, and, and very deliberate with each note. I, I feel like as we really got into it, this was one project where every single instrument that we recorded was a very deliberate decision, a reason for everything we did, which, uh, which I think worked out real nicely. Uh, and so f- for that reason, I-, I think this is the one that's most special to me so far. Uh, that, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, you know, for different reasons, I like different, different things. Um, I would say before I wake, um, and the reason why is because I read the script uh, recently, and it was it was called Somnia, and uh, we had just come off uh, Oculus with Mike Flanagan, and I, I just fell in love with the script. I, I thought it was it was just incredible, and um, you know when he shot it, uh, Jacob Tremblay was just he did such an amazing job, and and uh, and musically we we kind of you know we kind of got to push things a little bit, you know at, at that time people were more familiar with our, our sound as being uh, more tonal. Like we are guys that do tonal music. And strangely enough, that's not really where we come from. We come from more melodic of a back, our, our background and, and we love melody and stuff. So that we started to um, write more orchestral music in that movie and play some melody a little bit more. And, and it was kind of nice to show that. And I think it was just, it was just really fun and enjoyable. And, and, and the story, obviously I was super intrigued with. So for me, I would probably say if I had to pick one that was like super special, it'd probably be that. Um, you know, every project we've done, different ones have been special for different reasons. You know, so I think it's it just depends. But I but I think story and music, I'd have to go before I wait. I always love hearing about uh, different composers and actors too. They, they've all got their favorite projects, and it's always interesting to see what they pick and why they pick them. We're gonna come right back, wrapping up our interview with the Newton brothers and more. Stand by. This is Barry Boswick, and damn it, Janet, would you just keep listening and come back to geek to me Radio, will you? I have one thing to say, and that's damn it, Janet, I love you. Welcome back. We are wrapping up our conversation with composers extraordinaire, the Newton Brothers, talking about all sorts of horror-related music they've scored The Haunting of Hill House on Netflix. If you haven't seen that yet, check it out. You can hear their work there. And while we wrap it up, just uh, since they're multi-instrumentalists, <laughs> I missed it up that time, uh, I asked them, of course, what their favorite musical instruments were. And uh, I won't want to keep you too much longer. You're both, as I'm going to say it again, because I got it right the first time, multi-instrumentalists. Uh, do you have a, a favorite instrument? And we'll start with, uh, we'll start with Taylor. Uh, well, to, to be fair... I play like three instruments. Andy plays like twenty five. So uh, <laughs> you know, that's easy for me to that's it's easy it's easy for me to choose. Uh, but I would go with piano. Piano is my I grew up playing piano. Uh, you know, you, I had vocal lessons on with piano. It's piano piano is the instrument of, of choice for me. And Andy, I'd like you uh, to rank them one through twenty five, please go. <laughs> <laughs> I there's nothing I love more than just sitting at the piano and pl- I, I love the piano. It's, it's percussive, it's melodic. It's, it's just, it, it's, I love it as a tool. Like every single thing I do, 
I, I start, I shouldn't say everything, but most 98% <laughs> of everything I do starts with the piano. There, occasionally, if we're doing some like a certain vibe of a score on the guitar, I, I love guitar as well, but piano is definitely for me where I, I that's I, what I love the most. And you'll be able to hill, hear, try that again, you'll be able to hear their genius in The Haunting of Hill House October 12th on Netflix. Uh, you can binge it from there for the Halloween season. Andy Grush and Taylor Newton Stewart, where can people find out more about the two of you? Uh, social media, websites? Yeah, it's just our website, www.thenewtonbrothers.com. If they go there, you know, there's there's the links to Twitter and Instagram and all that, all that good, good stuff. Uh, so, yeah. And any other projects that you are getting ready to gear up to work on the weekend, kind of listen for you? There is a big project that we have coming up. Um, unfortunately, we don't have to talk about it just yet, uh, but, uh, but soon. And uh, we're, we're very excited about it, and we're just in kind of deep preparation for it. And, uh, and yeah, so there's lots of cool things on the horizon, but that's, <laughs> that's saying nothing, but that's, but that's it right now. <laughs> well, once, it, uh, once it's able to be announced, we can have you back on and talk about that, too, if you'd like. Yeah, love that'd be you. great. Love that'd thank be you. awesome. We would love that, James. Thank you. Great, yeah. Andy Grush, Taylor Newton Stewart, the Newton Brothers. Gentlemen, thanks so much for your time today. I greatly appreciate talking to you. We appreciate you. Thank thanks you so much. Me. The Newton Brothers. Very cool to talk to people behind the music like that. Uh, as we talked about in the interview, horror is such a uh, driven genre. The music behind it is really half the battle in getting those feelings pumping through your blood. So I'm always pleased to talk to uh, genius composers and people like that. Thanks again to our other guests, Jim Oosley and Ben Sawyer from The Dead Palace and Adam Walenta from Punk Taco. If you have a guest you'd like me to try to get on air or someone I should speak with, feel free to shoot me an email, james at geek2meradio.com. Until next week, my friends. It's not in the way you watch I sound. Good night.